Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan and we finally reached the finale of Ahsoka. And I have to say, I always get kind of sad when the final episode of a Star Wars show comes around. It's almost like I have to say goodbye to everyone as we get back to our normal lives without new Star Wars shows. I mean, I'll still be here. I'll still be here making content. But, you know, you get what I mean. And this finale of the Ahsoka series leaves me with some mixed feelings. I feel like everything happened the way we thought it would. And so I'm left at the end just wanting more. And not because uh, this episode was amazing. We'll probably talk about this more in another video where I just do a full review. I need some time to digest the entire series, I think, first. So I gotta say right away, I'm not really happy with how they portrayed Thrawn here in the series. If you've seen my previous videos, this has always been one of my... Uh, nitpicks with Filoni. I actually don't think they did a terrible job in Ahsoka with Thrawn. Um, it's just more small little nuanced things that I notice. And this has a lot to do, guys, with my own like personal biases. Like I've read all the Thrawn legends and canon novels, and this is probably not the most legitimate criticism because I have like so much invested into this character. I was kind of hoping we would get a more nuanced villain uh, in this portrayal of Thrawn. But I guess Balin Skull does fit that role pretty well, actually. Now, I understand that towards the end of his Imperial career, Thrawn has a major personality change as he gives in to his lust for power. But again, he just feels off to me here in these last few episodes. Now, I understand that Ahsoka, first and foremost, is supposed to be an adventure film um, and not like a war, like a hardcore war film. But that is sort of the character and genre Thrawn comes from. He is a military mastermind, a strategist with no equal. And so when he sends just two TIE fighters to take out Ahsoka's Jedi shuttle here, it just seems a bit arrogant and silly. It's like he's underestimating one of the most dangerous people on this planet. I know he's short on supplies, but he keeps sending troops little at a time. It doesn't seem to make any sense. I've watched many an Imperial officer make the same assumptions about the rebellion. Even I fell victim to the heroics of a single Jedi. Never again. Again, I only know, again, I know only certain fans are really gonna care about this. This is a very like niche concern, but it does really bother me. On the other hand though, Lars Mikkelsen as Thrawn is amazing. I feel like he is savoring and tasting each word that comes out of his mouth. Now, the second they start doing the ceremony to Morgan Ellsworth, I, I was kind of worried. I felt like they were gonna turn her into a monster. But luckily that doesn't happen. But if it wasn't apparent before, Morgan Ellsworth is really just a servant here, not even an apprentice to Thrawn's, but just another pawn on the grand strategy board. You know, all throughout the series, she tries to give Thrawn some actually pretty good tactical suggestions on how he should deploy his troops. and. You know, Thrawn kind of just brushes her off politely as he does. Although in some scenes you can kind of see the anger and frustration boiling beneath the surface. Again, it's, it's not very Thrawn-like in my opinion. But I guess now she's getting rewarded for her loyalty because she did a lot to get Thrawn to this point. You know, this scene kind of reminds me of when Peter Pettigrew gets like a uh, magical arm for helping Voldemort return, you know, to the living. You have proved yourself useful these past few months, Wormtail. I'm guessing the spell they're giving to Morgan Elspeth will increase her strength and speed. It probably is not that different from what Mother Talzin did to Savage Opress during the Clone Wars. It is interesting that the Great Mothers give Morgan the Blade of Talzin. I mean, Mother Talzin was a huge figure in Night Sister uh, history. She actually was one of the uh, first Great Mothers to unify all the tribes together and prevent infighting, which, you know, created a larger Night Sister society that was soon wiped out by General Grievous, but she is important. Now, what is interesting is that these great mothers on Peridia know about her, and so this means that there was some communication between Dothomir and Peridia. We do find out later from Ezra that Thrawn found this place. He woke up the witches, rebuilt his starship. It wasn't safe to come here alone. So it seems like the great mothers on Peridia were sleeping. I wonder if they were in hibernation. Maybe they were exiled here. I'm, I'm very curious about all this background information. I want to know more. It's really cool seeing the starship hovering over these villages here. It does look a little weird for me. I mean, I'm just not used to seeing starships flying so slowly, but it makes sense. I mean, it's probably using its repulsors here at slow speeds. You really also get a good sense of just how large ships in Star Wars are. I mean, this is considered a small ship, but 
you know, not compared to these uh, little caravans or Hauling around. I really love the scene where Ezra, the Boken Jedi from the wild, is rifling around Professor Hu Yang's workshop to build his own lightsaber. Hu Yang is definitely a bit irked, but again, as we've mentioned in previous videos, he has grandfather-like patience and sarcasm for these stupid humans. And I think it's really cute that Ezra thinks he knows what he's doing and isn't asking Hu Yang for help. Here, I've been teaching younglings how to construct lightsabers longer than you've been alive. That's great but I don't have time for lessons right now. Because everything he learns actually comes from his master, Kanan Jarrus. And I taught him how to build a lightsaber. What? Yeah, Hu Young is 25,000 years old and before the Ahsoka series, we first saw him in the Clone Wars series and he was sort of like the Mr. Ollivander of the Jedi Order. I make a lot of Harry Potter Star Wars references. And he helped every youngling build their lightsabers after they retrieved their kyber crystals from Elum during the gathering ceremony. And that means he remembers Ezra Bridger's master as well when he was a young boy. The other boy Caleb was very curious, a little shy perhaps. Well, who could blame him? Those were troubling times. He calls Kanan Caleb because that was his real name before Order 66. After Order 66, he changed his name to Kanan for security reasons, and he never changed it back, I guess. You now, if you haven't seen Rebels, then you might not understand the history between Ezra and Kanan. Basically, they're really, really close to one another, and I think Ezra would have really loved to hear more stories from Professor Hu Yang about Caleb when he was a younger man. Because Ezra truly looked up to Kanan. I mean, his master had gone out like a true hero. Probably should have never been chilling on that giant fuel tank in the first place when he died, but he ultimately owned up to that decision and sacrificed his own life to save everyone else's. One should never wish for death, but his was so pure, and I think Ezra Bridger will never forget him because of that. And so that's why this scene right here, what Professor Hu Yang does, it's really important. That's it. I had two of those. Kanan took the one, the other I held on to in case he ever needed it. It is proper that you should have it. I can't cry on camera because I'm not comfortable enough in my masculinity to do it, but uh, I, am, I am crying inside right now. I mean, that, that poor kid. And that's, that's how I was the entire episode, by the way. It was, oh, I can't believe they're doing this with Thrawn. I hate it. And then it's like, oh my God, I can't believe they did that in my heart. Damn you, Filoni. Damn you. And I really do love Hu Yang for doing this. I mean, he really is like a grandfather to all Jedi. And what's beautiful about Hu Yang is he's never been corrupted, really. I mean, he's a droid. He never got involved with the Jedi's ideals and restrictive ways, even if he holds those memories and rules inside of him. He never really tries to enforce them onto others. I mean, he tries a little bit, but he's really just kind of relaxed. I think he's learned over 25,000 years that this is the best way to go, and I think this is why Ahsoka can stand his presence. Professor Hu Yang doesn't have all the bad tendencies of the Jedi leaders of old, but he does represent the Jedi Order and the structure that she probably really likes. It's something that Balan Skull also longs for. I miss the idea of it. They all miss it. Now, I haven't talked much about the actor who portrays Ezra Iman Esfandi, and I have to say, I really like him as an actor. He's got these really bright eyes. He's he just exudes warmth, uh, warmness, warmth, warmth, yeah. And, you know, when he's on screen, he's definitely a presence. But I do feel like that darkness and edge that Ezra developed in later seasons of the Rebels show is missing here. I mean, he had to really grow and mature after Kanan died, but, heck, maybe this is what happens when you end up chilling with a bunch of nomadic turtle dudes for, like, a decade. He seems to have really mellowed out. Which kind of makes me think that he will have to go through his own character arc in the next season. If there's a next season. It's probably going to be next season. Anyway, after this, Hu Yang fills in Ezra about why Ahsoka and Sabine broke off contact before the show started. It's actually mentioned cryptically in episode 4, and uh, it's Balin Skull who kind of drops a few hints about this turmoil. Family died on Mandalore because your master didn't trust you. How the hell does he know this? I mean, he is impressive. He's, he's almost Thrawn-like in his ability to dig up dirt on other people and then use it against them before he fights them. But basically, we find out that Ahsoka stopped training Sabine because, quote, Ahsoka became afraid that Sabine was training as a Jedi for the wrong reasons after what happened on Mandalore. 
Yeah, we actually get to see this in the Book of Boba Fett. Well, the Mandalorian detour in the Book of Boba Fett. It's the Great Purge of Mandalore, and it's a terrifying experience. It's sad to know that Sabine lost her entire family, but what's even crazier is this next line. At the time, Ahsoka felt that if Sabine unlocked her potential, she would become dangerous. I knew immediately this was foreshadowing something. I mean, this is this is really interesting because up until this point, we 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 all thought that Sabine Wren was not force sensitive or just borderline force sensitive. I mean, she could barely move that cup. I have known many Padawans over the centuries, and I can safely say your aptitude for the force would fall short of them all. I thought she was gonna have to rely more on her weapons and her armor and her brains, you know, using those Mandalorian tactics. And I, and I felt like that would have made her a much more interesting and new character. But then again, I gotta ask myself, why would Ahsoka and Kanan train her if they didn't see potential in her? I think the fact that Sabine Wren uh, never showed much Force sensitivity irks some fans who are like, oh, you're just giving her the Force out of nowhere. But in Filoni's defense, she did wield the Darksaber and Generally speaking, if you're not force sensitive and you're wielding a lightsaber, you're you're gonna hurt yourself. <laughs> Sabine didn't really hurt herself. She actually defeated, you know, another non-force sensitive, but it's still pretty impressive. Now in our last episode, I noted how Ahsoka was kind of like the cool aunt. Because even though Sabine Wren really screwed up by gambling the fate of the galaxy by giving up that star map to Balin for a shot at seeing Ezra. The first time Ahsoka reunites with Sabine, she kind of is just happy to see her. She doesn't even scold her at all. And in this scene, she basically explains to Sabine why she's not really that angry. She talks about Anakin. Over the years, I've made my share of difficult choices. Often no one understood my reasons. Except my master. He always stood by me. Even when no one else did. This is really something that only Filoni can do because he's he's a company man. He's been with Star Wars for so long, and so he gets to watch a lot of the seeds he planted like a decade ago, uh, you know, flower into something really beautiful. In a sense, he puts more thought into the background, into the characters, than even George Lucas did. Filoni's just not really good at making realistic looking combat scenes though. Like I thought only stormtroopers couldn't hit anything. But these TIE fighter pilots are supposed to be elite. I mean, they're supposed to be able to hit stationary targets easily, especially Thrawn's TIE fighter pilots. It's actually supposed to be the fragility of their starships that is their main weakness. Ah, uh, yeah, there it is. You know, Thrawn being happy about taking out the shuttle and accepting the loss of the TIE fighter is, you know, it's acceptable. I can see him being like that. I mean, he's just feeding his units piecemeal to the Jedi. I feel like he's wasting more troops by not just finishing this battle once and for all. And so he places himself in a really bad position and he has to actually send more troops to delay Ahsoka and Ezra and Sabine. So we finally find out what those stormtroopers with the red ribbons are. Now we theorize that these stormtroopers are either undead or maybe these uh, red ribbons around their bodies are like charms to protect them. And I guess both of those answers are correct because Morgan Elsbeth does tell these night troopers that these red ribbons are like a magical charm that will protect them. The blessing of the great mothers shall protect you in battle against the Jedi. It's like those African warlords who tell their child soldiers that they can't die from bullets as long as they wear this magical clothing they've created for them. Yeah, that, that actually happens. It's kind of messed up. Except here, these charms, these ribbons, turn the stormtroopers into undead blaster sponges after they die for the first time. Those are the volunteers. Yes, Grand Admiral. They were made of where? They were. I feel like this is more like the old Thrawn I used to know here. Uh, yes, desperate situations call for desperate measures, but at least he's asking for volunteers. He's not like forcibly turning his night troopers into zombies and he's letting these men know exactly what will happen to them. And you could tell that he is uncomfortable about the situation. There's still a little bit of uh, humanity or chisanity in him. All were honored to make the sacrifice. For you. It is for the Empire. Things are getting a bit culty here, and you know, that's never a good thing. I feel like Thrawn also doesn't like this aspect. Yeah, we're not gonna talk about the howlers dancing through the turbo lasers, because you already know what I'm gonna say. 
And if you don't know what I'm going to say, you probably don't care about what I'm going to say, which is perfectly fine. You know, we all watch Star Wars for different reasons. As predicted, the Eye of Cyan is indeed a massive hyperspace ring. Seeing it in action is kind of epic. <laughs> Leaving Elspeth behind to hold the line, it's, it's kind of tragic, it's kind of sad. What's more interesting is that when Thrawn says, For the Empire. Elspeth says, you know, Death of Mir was technically destroyed by Palpatine's minions. I mean, wait until she find. well, you know, I guess she never does find out about this, but I'm pretty sure if she did find out about this, she would be pissed. But this also points to the fact that maybe Morgan Elspeth knows what Thrawn and the Great Mothers are going to do. In one of the last scenes, we do see the Chimera travel to Death of Mir, and they have all those caskets on board, so... I don't know, maybe something crazy will happen. Maybe there'll be a revival of the Night Sisters of Doth Amir. Actually, I'm, I'm counting on that happening. The lightsaber flights in this show have ranged from pretty average to really good. And Morgan Elspeth versus Ahsoka, part two, is pretty awesome. I mean, I love seeing Morgan Elspeth here with a sword instead of a spear. So the actress who plays Morgan Elspeth, Diana Lee Inosanto, actually started out her career as a stunt woman. She was in like Blade, she was in the uh, Walker Texas Rangers series, and her father was actually a student of Bruce Lee. So there's definitely a martial arts lineage here, and you can tell by the way she moves, she knows what she's doing. Now these two night troopers are a bit different from your average night troopers. They seem to be a death trooper, night trooper variant, which is just really confusing. And that's because in Legends, death troopers were the zombies. They were created by a um, Imperial weapons program gone wrong. There's some kind of pathogen just got all over this Imperial class Star Destroyer, killed everyone. Terrible situation. And judging by how these Death Troopers look underneath their masks, that's exactly what they are. But in canon, they're a little bit more sketchy about the details. We do know that in canon, the Death Troopers, who usually accompany, you know, ISB officers, are kind of like heavily modified soldiers. But here they clearly seem to be undead. I mean, they could take a lot of hits. This could also just be from the Night Sisters magic, which would make them undead, undead death troopers of the night. I don't know. I didn't really like this double force jump kind of thing they did at the end here. Um, I feel like there should have been a bigger buildup of Sabine's power reveal. I don't think they handled this whole thing well at all. But all criticism was forgotten when it was revealed that Sabine Wren stayed behind to help out her master instead of just abandoning her. It's an important moment for these two. I think their trust has uh, been re-solidified. I think that talk they had prior to this battle also helped a lot. By the way, I love how Thrawn was worried about stowaways making it on board, but he completely forgets to close the shield on that gigantic hangar door. Or keep a few more troopers to guard the hangar door. The fact that Thrawn talks smack to Ahsoka before dipping out of the galaxy, that just, it just doesn't seem like him. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> Thrawn would never waste his time on stuff like this. This is where a ronin such as you belongs. Today, victory is mine. We get to see Mirai, the uh, spirit owl, finally towards the end of the episode. It's the daughter's spirit animal. She was a celestial, a force god, who passed her life force into Ahsoka when she died on Mortis. This is really like the clearest shot we get to see Mirai in uh, live action, so that's kind of cool. The setup in the end is intriguing. We see Shin Hati return to the bandits, like a bandit lord. And Balin Skull ventures off into Middle Earth somewhere. And he ends up standing on a statue of what looks like a witch king. Or perhaps it's something else, maybe a celestial like the father. I don't know. Ezra Bridger arriving back into the galaxy on a New Republic ship dressed as a stormtrooper with those creepy spell ribbons on his armor is just classic Ezra stupidity. And he always liked his Imperial helmets. I'm surprised he didn't just get gunned down immediately, especially uh, after what happened the last time two random strangers boarded a New Republic cruiser. I really do like this idea of Sabine and Ezra changing places. It's almost like Sabine is paying Ezra back now. But it does create an interesting dilemma. I mean, the story splits into two. You have the more intimate tale, the Ronin story continuing in Peridia, while the space opera continues in the regular galaxy. I feel like they should almost make these two storylines into two separate shows. So there you have it, guys. That's my analysis of this finale. Um, subscribe, hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our coverage this week. We'll be talking about this quite a lot. All right, I'll see you next time, guys. Uh...